Uh, there are still days when I ask myself why I didn't leave the church altogether. If I were a secular person looking in, I would ask, why would you, as queer people who grew up in places that harmed you, why would you have stayed here? I think from countless numbers of queer folks who have found their way back into the church, we would say that for some strange reason, uh, the church could ruin just about everything for us, but that they couldn't take our real experience of the divine. I grew up in a conservative evangelical home, and my dad was the minister at the church that I grew up at. I knew very young that I was different from other kids. That I didn't know what that meant entirely, but, but I knew that what I needed to do was to perform. I actually believed wholeheartedly that change was possible. And if I could do anything, that I would change my sexuality. And so I, I doubled down. I figured if prayer could fix me, I would pray twice as hard. And if reading the Bible would somehow change my orientation, then I would, I would read no, no other book. I committed really hard. And I'd say for most of my life from puberty until my early 20s, I was convinced that the reason that it wasn't working was because I was still doing something wrong or not hard enough. I'm sure little gay boys looked up to me as somebody that could be proof that they could be fixed. Most reparative therapy programs focus on a few different like aspects of making someone more heteronormative. And so like the first one would be that you attempt to change your behaviors or the way that you act so that you appear to be less uh, flamboyant or less gay. The next part of it is uh, attempting to change orientation, which is uh, primarily done through like uh, spiritual practices. So things like, um, like praying the gay away, yeah, but then the, the actual process too, though, that you go through as somebody who's either seeks out or is told that they need to participate in reparative therapy, teach you about making attachments. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Forming, forming attachments with a woman. Right. Have children, have a family, and because like, somehow those attachments or relationships will mean more than sexual attraction. Towards the end of my degree, I realized that if I wanted to have a place in the church, in an evangelical church, as a man who was pretty openly ex-gay, in order to have any credibility in the community, I would need to have a wife. And I would need to have a normal family. It made sense to make it one of my best friends who I always communicated well with and uh, who had similar passions and goals for ministry. And Chris was aware that I was on the road to recovery. It was just before graduation that we sat down and um, decided to give whatever dating we wanted to call it a try. So we dated for like four months and then we got engaged. 
I got married, and we had two children. Okay, Artemis, come here. I don't think people who are outside of these communities realize just how powerful it is to tell the same narrative over and over again from everyone that you've ever known and everyone you've loved. To be formed with a sort of communal persecution complex that views the world with a sort of a bit of fear and, and tied up in all of that is an anti-intellectualism that says, if you read certain books, or if you go to certain schools, or if you broaden your horizons even beyond the scope of what you've seen, then you could be taken in by the devil. Oh, I was absolutely worried that I would burn in hell, that no matter how much pain there could be in this lifetime, it, would, it cannot compare to burning for eternity. I don't know where the... I, I honestly, I have a hard time telling the story from the beginning because there are just so many blurry parts, partially because I was drinking through a lot of it and, and I was so severely depressed that I could barely get up most mornings. And I look back and so much of it's a blur. <laughs> And people ask, how many months was it between this and this? And, and I have a really hard time remembering the, even the order of events. I barely remember the birth of our second son. I mean, it didn't work. Reparative therapy just doesn't work. I did all the things that should have worked according to the prescriptions of the ex-gay movement. I mean, at that point, I was, I, was at the, I was at the end of the process. I had basically jumped through all the hoops necessary for years, and I had worked all the way up to my dream, really. And here we were with a newborn and a one-year-old watching the sweater unravel, really. <laughs> like watching the whole, the whole thing just come apart. On the one hand, there was this finally, like a breath, like we could finally say what we were thinking the whole time. And on the other hand, just that like, what the hell are we gonna do now? <laughs> I was not coping well with ministry and with just the constant feeling that I was living a lie because I was living a lie. I became more and more aware that I was not only affecting myself negatively, we felt like we had reached our separation date. We could get a divorce, we could free one another from our marriage vows so that we could be the family that we felt like we needed to be. And, and that meant that we would, we would continue to live together and that we would continue to raise children together. Our primary covenant was to and with our family. We probably had some of the most difficult conversations about 
what we were going to do. I told my bishop and some of my mentors and colleagues, and I was told this second that I sort of let the cat out of the bag, that I would be out of a job, that I would not have a place of ministry or leadership in my church. There were a lot of people who were extremely unhappy. If they couldn't get me back, then at least they could paint me as something. Coming out cost me family and all of my friends. I still think there's like a lot of shame around that, that it was after choosing to live authentically and it was after making the hardest decision of my life. It was that, that that broke me. For me, for me, that looked like an attempt at suicide. Like, I don't know, our kids were so young, I don't know what effect it's gonna have on them, but Right. There's going to be some point where, when we're going to have to have a conversation with them, right? That's yeah. like, hey, this is a thing. This right. Is and they're just wire. getting old enough now where they're starting to ask, like, well, why would you get married if yeah. you don't like women? Yeah. But at the core, I think, the part of reparative therapy that people don't really talk about much is that it's like, it is inherently misogynistic oh to believe that um, women are objects, are objects to for, be used to fix your own sexuality. To fix people's sexuality, exactly. I don't even think you would remember. I don't, no. Not I feel even so fun. badly. So, like, my, my therapist, after I came out, told me I needed to go sit in a gay bar by myself with a patent paper and write. And I sat in the back and just cried the whole time. Aww. And I can remember that you came over and you're like, are you okay? Is like everything fine? And I was like having such a moment and you're just like, it's gonna be okay. And do you know, you don't remember this at all? I, not even no. close, no. <laughs> I make a lot of like, people cry I know. Though, so it was very rarely is it for good reason. <laughs> it was a beautiful moment. I had to be hopeful and I had to believe that, that this path was not only right, but that there would be something really good uh, that would come out of all this. So I looked into some options for churches that accept a gay, lesbian, and transgender priests and clergy and uh, I found that the Anglican church was a safe place uh, for people like me to call home. Hello. How are you? I got a good network of friends and I found a good community at church and I started to do some of the hard work of forgiveness and of asking to be forgiven and to work through reconciling with my family. And it was through those little baby steps that I started to get pulled out of the pit. A lot of people think that this is like over and that people don't go to reparative therapy anymore, but like... Yeah, and even up until maybe a year ago, um, I, was still, I was still getting messages from well-meaning, loving family about reparative therapy places yeah, that could help fix that us. That could help fix us somehow. <laughs> and I just want to be like, that's how we got into this in the first place. Like, we know that this doesn't work and is damaging. Yeah. And yet there still is this sort of, I don't know, moral high ground that says, we can fix you because you're broken. I had no reference point for what it would look like to fall in love with another man. 
because as a, a little queer kid, I didn't see those stories represented in the media. And if they were in the media, I was never allowed to see them. Now I had to enter a world of dating that was nothing like it was when I was a 14 year old. And not only that, but I was now dating people who I had the potential of falling in love with because they were men. <laughs> I actually didn't know if it would go anywhere for me. It was a little bit unexpected. It just seemed so easy to fall in love. In time, I realized that he loved my kids and that he loved Chris. The family and the utopian dream that Chris and I had come up with, it was actually starting to unfold in a way that I didn't think would be possible. Where Chris was encouraging me along the way and where she was Alex's cheerleader and saying, he is really good to you and you, you are really happy for the first time. That'll do. It, it feels like it pulls you into the yeah. front, right? Like it's... <clears throat> hey, Chris, where's the giant rainbow? Do you give us context of what's happening tonight? Yeah, so tonight's our annual um, pride service to just celebrate sort of that church has room for LGBTQ people and also say there's still work to do. It is overkill, but drag queens will not be happy with any less light. And in fact, that's maybe... Can I see what this is like off? Can I just pull this? So often, the church tends to prop up really outdated patriarchal gender roles and having drag queens in a church. I think it's a really interesting parable of how the way that God does things is always upside down and that it's not the way that uh, you would expect. Don't you have a sermon to be writing right now? Yeah. I might go... Nuts? Yeah, no, I might go open up the front doors. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Like, yeah, just, I just feel like it's missing something. Cool. Yeah. It's really hard for... No. I could really use you to help that sound system get set up. Is that okay? The other thing is, if we can hear both of you through here and we're sitting behind you, yeah. at least I can hear what's going on. Do you know if you can get these ones? No, that's... If I don't get the pin, there's nothing I can do. Do you have one of those handheld ones? Christ Church. Maybe it's... it's probably Cheryl. Hello. It's all taken care of, then it's all taken care of. Okay. I just need a handheld microphone. That's all I need. Oh, it's been a long day. Yeah. Um, Church with Drag Queens is about to happen. I can do it. I am really good at this. <laughs> Let's think about the spaces that we create and that we curate. Let's think about the ways that we take up space and the ways that we advocate for other space. That the skin and the flesh and the bones, the that Jesus took on, that God says, this body is good. This body is something that I've given you to steward, to take care of, and to also let you operate in the world at the way that you do. So tonight, take up the space that maybe you don't feel you can take up in every church. And let's let this moment of communion and Whatever you do with the divine, let that be a spark that starts this cry for more justice, for equality, for peace, and ultimately that all of us find our fabulous, beautiful, God-given selves in these bodies.
Is this anybody's first time here for the show? Ah, uh, I was the churchiest church boy you've ever churched with. I, I did all the readings, I taught Sunday school, I was the only member of the senior choir who couldn't accept old age pension. I, tonight is super special for me. And it really reaffirmed to me that we're all more alike than we are different. And I can remember even Chris saying, I think, I think we found our family. Are you talking? Mm -hmm. Mama, mm -hmm. a kitten tail no microphone. When we make like short movies. Ooh. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We make them every day. Yeah. Do you make episodes every day? Our life is basically an episode. Hi. Okay, sing. Jesus, Jesus love me, this I know for the Bible sing. tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. <laughs> <laughs> that was something that I never could have expected or dreamed of in a million years. That I would be standing with priests and with a bishop in the diocese to affirm that my love was not only valid, but that my love was being celebrated by God. And so when we stood in that church on our wedding day, uh, we stood as a family. Our kids got a papa. And that feels sort of complete. Why can't we have a church that will celebrate who we are? My identity, the fullness of my identity, has been affirmed by my bishops and has been affirmed by the Church of God. We had so many moments where we looked to other people to be like, somebody's, somebody's been doing this, somebody can do family the way we were doing it, and we just didn't see it. And so part of our decision in talking about it and to share and for sharing our story is just we can do it. We can do it. Right back down to the beginning of where Christian community comes from is in saying, this is about including more people. This is about drawing the circle wider and then focusing not at the center, but on the margins, focusing on the people who seem least like they fit in here. Yes, I am queer. Yes, I am a Christian. Yes, I am a priest. And although there are people who would think and say that that is a contradiction or heresy, I believe that I am called by God and that I have a job to do. And I cannot in good conscience do anything else. Yeah.